The First World War had seen conflict and destruction on a scale never before imagined. Mainland Europe lay horrifically scarred, both in terms of its dead and its landscape. But as the last months of war dragged on, there was a significant symbol of hope and renewal in Britain. In September 1918, Britain's most famous monument, Stonehenge, was given to the nation by a Mr. Cecil Chubb, a lunatic asylum proprietor, who'd bought the stones at auction a few years before. After centuries of vandalism and neglect, Stonehenge would at last be protected and restored. Fallen stones righted and lintels repositioned. In a land fit for heroes, it heralded a new age of government responsibility for the nation's heritage, when the men from the ministry would command a massive rescue operation. But at the same time, and not so very far away from the nation's ancient sites, the cities of Britain were modernizing and expanding haphazardly into the countryside. The motor car, newly affordable, was on the rise. And a crisis faced the country houses of Britain. Most frightening of all, Hitler would target our finest old buildings in the infamous Baedeker raids of World War II. New heroes rallied to the cause as the fight to save Britain's great buildings reached a new intensity. There is one symbol of our national history that is so familiar we have come to view it as timeless. The ruin. Many are the remains of the nation's greatest medieval buildings, set on a path of ruin in two of the most dramatic periods of upheaval in Britain's history. Religious buildings caught up in the violence of the Reformation in the 1530s and castles that fell victim to the English Civil War in the 1640s. These ruins have a familiar look. The bare stripped stone, the glassless Gothic windows, the bowling green lawns, and the metal plaques telling us what we need to know. But it's a look very different from how it used to be. For centuries, the ruins of Britain had to take their chances against relentless nature, and nature often won. In the 18th and 19th centuries, ivy-clad and tree-infested, they inspired romantic poets and artists to ponder the fleeting nature of human endeavor and existence. But by the 1920s, the world had changed. For a Britain emerging from the horrors of the First World War, the ruin had truly lost its romance. The First World War was a time of mass destruction, destruction of human beings, of British youth, and a time of mud, carnage, filth, despair, and futility. And I think, very importantly, guiding some of the spirit of the new official public attitude towards conservation and heritage was the belief that we needed to cleanse away, clean, and set up this bright new world. The bright new world dawned in Whitehall, in a government ministry called the Office of Works. Thanks to the new Ancient Monuments Act of 1913, government officials now had the power to declare there were ancient buildings of such importance their owners could no longer neglect them and allow them to fall down. And in return for handing them over, the government would foot the bill for repairs and maintenance and open them to the public. The law extended only to historic buildings that were uninhabited and in practice that meant ruins. 
but it was a huge advance from the neglect of the previous century. And in 1918, many great ruins were on the verge of collapse. The Office of Works had to move fast. The inspectors set out on their mission right across the country. What this whole zeitgeist, if you like, uh, enabled to take place was a massive collecting spree which the Office of Works went on. Um, they went around the country, taking into their care um, all the, the major uh, ruined buildings, the medieval abbeys, castles, they could possibly get their hands on. One or two they didn't take, one or two they wanted, they couldn't get, but um, hundreds and hundreds of buildings came into their care. Success would come down to the vision and willpower of one man, Charles Reed Piers, the new inspector of ancient monuments. Piers was a very different man from the 19th century heritage pioneers whose sensitivity towards a building had outlawed drastic intervention. They had preached a gospel against scrape and clean, preserving what they called the golden stain of time. But Piers had a crisis on his hands and out of the ruinous confusion, he wanted clarity and order to emerge. His house at Chiselhampton in Oxfordshire still boasts a calm symmetry of classical order and nature tamed. Piers was a great gardener. He, like everyone in the Office of Works, had been to either Oxford or Cambridge and had been used to seeing historic buildings set against beautifully mown green grass in the, in, in the college quads. And I think this aesthetic of ruin against the calm of the grass was seen as something that was extremely attractive. How those ruins could be set, uh, set um, not in the sort of the fields of mud of, of, of the trenches, but in something that um, anchored them in the, the sort of conception of, of England. <laughs> Piers was an architect and an archaeologist. He was charming and energetic. He inspired loyalty in his team, but he did not suffer fools gladly. His family called him the Squire. Piers had a clear vision of what the nation must do with its great ruins. And it was not just a matter of rescuing them from collapse. Above all, he wanted them to speak to the nation, to tell a clear and accessible story. You needed to be able to read the nation's history in the stones. And that meant getting rid of later accretions. That meant taking down the ivy. That meant taking down later buildings that were built up against the medieval walls. It meant simplifying them, pr printing plans of them, clear guidebooks with clear phases, putting labels on each individual part of the building. So this was a, a, a great exercise in explaining to the nation its own history. His mission was high-minded and it was commercial. If the ruins spoke to everyone, more visitors would come. He would make ruins into popular textbooks. The flat pages would be the green lawn and the stones would be the text. But first, he needed a vital bit of newfangled technology. Before the motor mower, achieving the perfect lawn had been an expensive, labor-intensive process. You needed a small army with scythes and rollers. Then came the horse-drawn mower, followed by the steam-operated contraptions that never quite caught on. But the mass-produced motor mower would change the look of heritage forever. It's a uh, 1920s Atco standard. Uh, this is a 14-inch model. This machine gives a perfect strike finish, which was ideal for formal lawn. This machine of its time would have been the height of technology at an affordable price. And it was sort of like a, an industrial revolution. Uh, instead of having to push the machine up and down, it went on its own. Uh, it was so easy to use uh, and extremely reliable. <laughs> <laughs> 
and to make the castles and the stately homes more pleasing to the eye, they would have used a machine like this. Beautiful, formal British striped lawn that this machine was designed to do. And it would do sterling work for miles and miles of cutting grass. And you'd finish with a finish as good as a carpet. And up went the signs telling you precisely what was what. Today, the successor to the Office of Works is English Heritage. Keith Emmerich is an ancient monuments inspector in Yorkshire. We're still the government's advisor on all matters of the of cultural heritage and the historic environment. He's on his way to Revo Abbey in North Yorkshire, the first major site to get the Office of Works treatment. Revo was founded in 1132 and became one of the richest religious institutions in England. So when Henry VIII broke with the Catholic Church in the 1530s, it was high on his hit list. Henry took its treasures and stripped the building of anything valuable. The king ordered Revo to be rendered uninhabitable, which it has been ever since. Revo was handed over to the Office of Works by the Feversham family after the death of the Earl at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. I just have a quick look around the site. Indeed. Okay, if there's anything. Noticed anything at all? Any bits fallen off? We I've... did have a tree fall, a branch right, fall okay. the other day, yeah. It didn't hit anything, though. No, thankfully. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. When the Office of Works took over Revo, it was on the brink of collapse. And after the recent bad weather, Keith is here to check all is well. What I'm looking for is just evidence of uh, what's called spalling, where... Um, kind of frost action and the, the water getting behind the, the stone or the detail of the stone is then expanded as it's frozen and forced um, pieces of the, the decorative detail off or whether there's something actually more catastrophic um, that might be going on. But I, I doubt if there's, the latter is the case, but there's usually, once we get into the, the start of the, the winter season, we might expect to see some, um, some spalling, but it's always good to keep an idea of, keep a sense of how much there is or how little there is. In accordance with the Peer's Bible, Revo was shorn of its ivy. Post-medieval accretions, even picturesque cottages, were pulled down, and the ground made even to reveal foundations. But there was an immense structural challenge here. The monument was top-heavy, with the upper stories leading out alarmingly. Piers and his architect Frank Baines authorised major surgery on the very innards of the abbey walls. When the Ministry of Works came to the site, the whole of the East End was moving quite considerably. The upper part of the building was actually hanging out about two feet or more beyond its base. So they scooped out all of the core work and they drove railway rails through the fabric to actually knit the, the three walls together. And then they filled the interior with concrete, and then they put the stonework back on the face in exactly the same position so that all the repairs are completely hidden. So you think that you're looking at an authentic building, whereas really it's what perhaps might be called a, a staged authenticity. The scale of the work was quite amazing. The clearance of the site was kind of, if you like, on an industrial scale. They employed a lot of returning and disabled uh, World War I veterans to do the work. There were small railway systems that were built to take the material as they were excavating it off the site. It was just a huge, huge undertaking. Piers' intervention was fantastically bold. This is medieval fabric with a modern steel and concrete core, but it worked. It's not how we do it now, 
Um, but I don't think we can criticise them because what is absolutely clear is that if the Office of Works had not taken on all those uh, ruins in the inter interwar period, they wouldn't be here today. They'd all reached a sort of stage of final collapse and for every one ruin that was taken in by the Office of Works, there were two or three that fell down and have now disappeared. The heritage laws had worked brilliantly well for roofless and uninhabited ruins. The great abbeys and castles of the nation were saved, and in just a few years, they had established themselves on even the most casual day trippers itinerary. One of the most pleasant of places to go to, a spot that's almost bursting with memories of the glorious past, is ancient Tintagel in Cornwall. There, if your bent is towards an old castle, overlooking sea and ready for immediate occupation, little remains but for you to see the remains. So this way, please, ladies. But if the only means of protecting a building was for the government to acquire it, and it had to be roofless and uninhabited to qualify, it was still a painfully small answer to the crisis. In the 1920s, the cities of Britain were modernizing, and nowhere more so than London. The mood was for progress and modern urban living. The demolition gang reigned supreme, and in a world that had little time for Georgian splendors and hated Victorian architecture, the casualty list was high. When you look at the buildings that disappeared, we now think so wonderful, all the great, almost all the great private palaces, the aristocratic townhouses, Norfolk House, Dorchester House, Devonshire House, Lansdowne House, they all went. The Foundling Hospital, Waterloo Bridge, Regent Street, all these things um, disappeared. There are always people who think that you mustn't stand in the way of what they imagine to be progress. Um, you know, the world, in some ways, after the catastrophe of the war, was getting better with cars and the wireless, uh, aeroplanes, all this sort of thing. Why care about old buildings? Um, uh, it's probably the most destructive period in London's history. But the cities of Britain were also expanding fast. The new suburbs seemed to promise a life of convenience and comfort, leaving behind the dirty city. Between the two world wars, English cities sprawled intensely and immensely. Um, there are various reasons for it. There was a desire to create lots of new, uh, clean, green housing for people, new suburbia that would be healthy for people, a great concern about public health. The new suburbs would be clean, there'd be tennis playing, they would have gardens, and uh, people would be would brush their teeth and wash their faces, and they would be a lot healthier with clean air. Inevitably, it was the open countryside that bore the brunt of the spreading suburbs. Thousands of new homes spread out from the edges of towns and cities. New roads ripped through the countryside in an unplanned free-for-all. A new disease was even diagnosed, bungaloiditis. The countryside was definitely under siege. It was undergoing a fundamental transformation and the amount of land that changed hands after the first world war was as much as the amount of land that changed hands after the dissolution of the monasteries there was a whole change in the nature of the way the countryside was run who owned it who lived in it who enjoyed it who went to it this was profoundly unsettling for uh, those people who liked the countryside as it was villages that had felt safely distant from urban sprawl was suddenly too close for comfort. New pressure groups formed to stop the invasion, led in 1926 by the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England. The battle was on. Here, less than 30 miles from London, you're in the heart of rural England. The old thatched cottage which might be somewhere in Devonshire instead of less than 30 miles from London, will have disappeared. And in its place, there may perhaps be petrol stations and roadside cafes, garages and camping sites. 
Just the other side of the hedge is the old road. Little traffic passes along it during the day. At night, there is practically none. Yet the old road is to be made five times its present width, and soon there'll be no room for butterflies. The moment called for a champion, and it got one in the unexpected form of a Welsh architect and aesthete, Clough Williams Ellis. Clough Williams Ellis was an extraordinary creature, if you've met him. He was this tall Anglo-Welsh aristocrat who wore very flamboyant um, outfits, big wide-brimmed hats, yellow cravats, knickerbockers, um, white, white socks, great wonderful brogue shoes. But beyond the flamboyance, he was a very serious-minded man who was very important in the idea of trying to stop the sprawl. Cities and towns should be compact. The countryside should be beautiful and green. In 1928, Clough wrote a book, England and the Octopus, a polemic against the sprawl of suburbia. It was Britain's first environmental bestseller, and it was a call to action. He wrote, In the late war, we were invited to fight to preserve England. We believed, we fought. It may be well to preserve England, but better to have an England worth preserving. We saved our country that we might ourselves destroy it. The image of the octopus would become a defining symbol of the interwar years, its tentacles a rallying call against the urban sprawl known as ribbon development. But Clough did not confine himself to words alone. He set about proving his case, and so he built a new town, Port Myrion, in northwest Wales, on the edge of Snowdonia. People treat this a joke because it looks like a pastiche Italian hill town. But it is an important statement in architecture and urban planning because it tries to show how you can get lots of people into a small area, enhance the landscape with architecture and cause no damage to the natural environment. What Clough wanted to say was that you could take that example of Port Merion and you could make it much bigger, of course. You could create a whole new town like that. Begun in the 1920s, Port Merion would take 50 years to complete and Clough was there to see it finished. The town is full of wit and tricks of the eye. A grand frontage often hides a more humble dwelling, and humble dwellings embrace the picturesque. Clough also reused architectural salvage on a grand scale, rescued from demolition sites around the country. He called it a home for fallen buildings. I suppose I wanted to paint a propagandist picture, you might say. I wanted to show that you could develop a place, even a very beautiful place, without defiling it. In fact, if you did it with sufficient loving care and, and expertise, you might even add to what God had given you as your background. And beyond the flamboyance, it's still a serious exercise in high-density building, cramming a lot in without compromising the landscape, a retort in bricks and mortar to the ribbon development of the 1920s and 30s, the growing curse of the octopus. But even as the landscape was changing, more people than ever were setting out to explore it. It was the golden age of the Sharabang, bringing urban dwellers out to the countryside, and the newly affordable mass-produced motor car. It was truly the romantic age of motoring. The pioneer driver was king of the road. The motor car allowed people to explore the nation's heritage in a new and liberated way. Visitor numbers boomed. It was the birth of an extraordinary relationship between the nation's ancient monuments and the motor car. Mm -hmm. 
Today, motoring magazines are almost entirely about cars. Full of, they're full of alluring pictures of fast cars. In the 1920s and 30s, things were a bit different. Almost every issue had quite a lengthy article on touring by car. They'd have lots of photographs of villages, um, churches and so on, usually with a car sitting somewhere in a corner of the photograph. And car manufacturers would actually use um, historic buildings as part of their advertisements. For example, Austin, for their Austin 7 model, had pictures of the Austin actually standing outside a ruined abbey. And you have an extraordinary boom in books, for example, um, that catered for people who wanted to go out into the country. Um, Batsford started to bring out a series of books called the English Heritage Series and the Face of Britain. And these sold in numbers that were completely unprecedented for books on um, the English landscape. Similarly, you have the shell guides coming out. So there were a whole range of books designed to encourage you to go and see your England. But it, it was a two-edged sword, really, because on the one hand, the car magazines were encouraging people to go out into the country, but at the same time, in doing that, the owners of the cars were actually often damaging the very thing that they were going out to look at. There were already some worrying signs. Even the landscape around Stonehenge was suffering from the clutter of the motor car. And soon, petrol advertising would be out of control. But the campaign for the beautification of roads fought successfully for unsightly petrol advertising to be removed. And by the 1930s, filling stations were even trying to get the heritage look themselves. Tudorbethan cottage style and the inflammable thatched look. Now, of course, the filling stations from the golden age of motoring are heritage too. In Dane End in Hertfordshire, the old village forge was converted to a filling station in the 1930s. And John Minnis has his modern listing hat on. In almost every respect, this is, this is really typical of its period, and it's still got some of the old um, enamelled signs on it that you can see there. One for spark plugs, and there's another sign for India tyres. What we're looking at here are a couple of um, probably late 1930s pumps, and uh, if we just take a closer look at them, we can see there Avery Hardell, who were one of the leading manufacturers of petrol pumps. These were electric pumps of a type that came in in the um, mid-1930s. They've lost the globes that they would have once had. They'd have once had illuminated globes on the top. But otherwise, they're still pretty intact, and there are very few petrol pumps today that really... Um, date from this era still in situ. Collectors have got quite a few that have been taken from their original locations, but here we are with these still in front of the garage that they once served. So it, it's a real period piece. In the 1930s, the campaign to make the countryside accessible to everyone was growing. It was the great age of rambling. Mass trespass was almost a weekend pastime. More and more people publicly declared themselves the enemy of the octopus, the enemy of urban sprawl wrecking the countryside. One such group was a mysterious band of bright young things called Ferguson's Gang. In 1932, Reports began to appear in the newspapers when a masked member of the gang, styling herself Red Biddy, turned up at the National Trust's office in London and handed over a swag bag of cash. The gang members bought their masks from Harrods, 
and like to feast on figs with cream and champagne. Other members of the gang left similar deposits, calling themselves Bill Stickers, Herb the Smasher, and Kate the Nark. At the time, no one knew who they were or how the money had been come by. Their greatest coup came when the BBC allowed a masked member of the gang to address the nation. I appeal to you tonight for the National Trust. That means for the beauty of England that belongs to you and me and is vanishing from under our eyes. No government grant supports the work of the Trust and it urgently needs more subscribing members to help in its battle against the octopus. The octopus, whose tentacles in the shape of jerry-built estates and ribbon development are stretching like a pestilence over the face of England. The appeal led to a flood of donations and new members for the Trust. A stretch of the Cornish coastline was donated and a town hall on the Isle of Wight. Priory cottages in Oxfordshire and 18th century Shalford Mill in Surrey were saved. The mill would become the gang's headquarters where they swore oaths on the grindstone to preserve England and frustrate the octopus. Everyone in the gang is long since dead and only recently have their true identities been revealed. The leader of the gang, Bill Stickers, was in fact Peggy Pollard, a Sanskrit scholar, naturist and six-foot great-niece of Victorian Prime Minister William Gladstone. It was her brother, Herb the Smasher, in reality Old Etonian Bobby Gladstone, who had made the masked broadcast at the BBC. Joanna Bagnall and Penelope Adamson have come back to the mill. They're the daughters of gang members the Artichoke and Black Mary. They remember life at the mill in the early 30s could be surprising. I remember picking up Ned Biddy with a donkey and cart. Oh, yes. That was fun at the station when she had a baby, and I was shocked because she fed the baby on the platform. Breastfeeding the baby on the platform. I know, and I was really by horror at this thing. Very embarrassed, but anyway... I was brought up in awe of them. Well, naturally, because they were very well more educated than we were. <laughs> more, and, and we were very young anyway, darling. They were very f thoughtful people. Yes, right. And very uh, intellectual. I'm well, sure. that's why they used to sit around the mill stones. And do discussions. Just, and you could have eight members, because they could get their legs yes, in. Yes, and they right. struck the grain shaft saying, I commit myself to the preservation of old well, England oh, Rory, by defying, oh. defying the octopus. Well, like the Bloomsbury set, in a way. Oh, they were. I felt that they came from very wealthy families. Not all of them by any means. Red Billy did. Uh, Red Billy was a... She was. She was a colonel's daughter yeah, or something general, like that. A general daughter, actually. Yes, yeah, a general's daughter. Socialists, too. Yeah. They were socialists, but their families necessarily weren't socialists. Well, they must they were have been country gentlemen. To a certain extent, I you know, to condemn them completely. I think they were probably masked then. And then yes, they, they were great fun because they liked to they dress did. up. They loved dre dressing up. And I do remember it was just peppered with gaiety of other people's gaieties and our gaieties. And all around, and the crowds of people coming. But the, I don't remember them having vast parties, but parents had big parties down here. Lots of children, all these children were rushing around. So I couldn't get to that. 80 years on, the National Trust is celebrating the gang. And octopus is on the menu. This is the octopus that um, anyone can kind of tame the tentacles if they want. It might just try that. And you remember meeting the gang, don't you? Mm. <laughs> Bill Stickers, yes. Bill Stickers, yeah, yeah. That's, that's your... That's my aunt. Your aunt. <laughs> I feel very honoured to be amongst you all and only wish the gang were here. So hold on to the memory, cherish it, and carry it on. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs>
Shelford Mill is typical of the type of building the National Trust liked in the 1920s and 30s. From its earliest days, saving open landscape and woodland had been its priority. And when the Trust saved buildings, they tended to be modest and vernacular, wedded to the landscape. But a crisis was looming that would make both the Trust and the Office of Works with its great portfolio of ruins re-examine their priorities. It was the magazine Country Life that spotted the problem in its property for sale pages. The crisis made a hot story for the newsreel cameras from America. And as one fine old mansion after another is sold for taxes and delivered to the wreckers, bankrupt peers face necessities even more precedent-breaking. The Marquis of Huntley, listed in Burke's peerage as the premier peer of Scotland, goes out to earn his own bread and butter. <laughs> well, I want a job, as a matter of fact. I have an appointment to see the manager. I wonder if you could uh, show me where, where he is, can you? Well, certainly. What's the name? Lord Huntley. For the toffs up against it, the easy option was to seek their fortune elsewhere. Many of the biggest country houses were Georgian or Victorian, not even old enough to be considered interesting in the 1930s. They faced demolition, the parkland sold, and their collections broken up. Unless something is done to preserve these beautiful old country houses and gardens, in a generation, half of them will be in ruins through taxation and death use. It's very easy sitting here in the um, 21st century to imagine that it was always going to be the National Trust that was going to save the nation's country houses. But that was far from clear um, in the 1930s. And um, before the Second World War, there was a pretty mixed attitude towards country houses. Um, they weren't really regarded as, as proper heritage. They weren't really regarded as proper history. I mean, Georgian architecture was only really just beginning to be um, properly uh, appreciated like that. Barrington Court, a great Tudor house in Somerset, was much more to people's tastes at the time. Barrington was the National Trust's only big country house purchase in 40 years but it had annoyed the Trust's formidable founder, Octavia Hill. The story of the Trust and Stately Homes sort of starts um, actually with Barrington Court, um, an empty house which they felt they had to save, and it nearly bankrupted the Trust. And there were lots of sort of maybe apocryphal stories of um, every time the National Trust wanted to take on another building, people going darkly, remember Barrington, you know, because it was a complete disaster financially. Um, and I think actually that, that turned the Trust rather against country houses, in fact, uh, for a long time. And certainly Octavia Hill was very critical of all this money being, you know, in her view, wasted on country houses instead of open spaces which she wanted. I think that um, in the early days of the discussions within the National Trust about how it might get involved in country houses, there was huge reluctance to get involved in it. I mean, they couldn't see why they should. The, the, many of the sort of senior people in the National Trust had been and were socialists, some of them were communists even. You know, suddenly getting involved with all these toffs who were in dire straits was, you know, an extraordinary um, step forward. But the National Trust was changing. From the early years of middle-class philanthropists campaigning for the countryside, it would become more literary, artistic. Soon the aesthetes would arrive. And it was beginning to attract a Viscount or two, even the occasional Marquis. The Trust in the interwar period became really very aristocratic. I mean, it, it, the, 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 the inheritance of Octavia Hill, Rawnsley and Hunter had changed quite radically. Um, and by the 1930s, uh, with the development of the country house um, concept, um, it was, the language in which it was expressed was quite remarkable. I and mean, they actually said, we, we, must, we must have country houses in which the people can have weekends. Uh, I mean, it was taking the concept of the country house weekend and trying to nationalise it. The tussle was on 
On the one hand, the Office of Works. On the other, the National Trust. The future of the country house hung in the balance. What we have to remember is that in the 1930s, the Office of Works had been incredibly successful in gathering together a collection of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of historic buildings. To get hold of them, they had negotiated with aristocratic owners, and the aristocratic owners had handed over these wonderful ruins of abbeys and their old castles and things quite happily to the government that was going to look after them. And so it was seen absolutely naturally within the Office of Works that when the issue of the country house was um, faced, it was going to be the Office of Works who dealt with them. Then the Trust had a brainwave. It proposed taking on country houses in lieu of death duties. The houses would open to the public while the former owners could continue to live in the houses as tenants. The government agreed. It would be called the Country House Scheme. And it looked like a breakthrough. But the titled homeowners were having none of it. Many of them were very conservative. They hated the state. They didn't want you know, the state to take over their house. Um, the National Trust, with its various tax advantages, appeared to be an agency of the state. By the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, the scheme had gone nowhere. And there were more important things to think about as both the British people and its precious old buildings faced a new type of conflict. For the first time, the cities and towns of Britain prepared for a massive onslaught from the skies. Air raids had been few and far between in World War I. Now the home front, the heritage front, would be directly in the firing line. The London Blitz and the bombing of Coventry showed what aerial bombardment could do. Britain would retaliate with a raid on the coastal town of Lübeck. In einem militärisch und wirtschaftlich völlig sinnlosen Luftangriff legten die Engländer mit Brand- und Sprengbomben einen Teil der Altstadt in Trümmer und vernichteten dabei weltberühmte Kunstschätze. Der Dom, ein Bauwerk aus dem 12. Jahrhundert. British Bomber Command had chosen Lübeck because it was an achievable target. But it had resulted in the destruction of hundreds of fine German medieval buildings. Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, wrote in his diary, We will respond by raising English cultural shrines to the ground. That is now to be done on the biggest scale possible. And on the 27th of April, 1942, Baron Gustav and Sturm of the German Foreign Office revealed, we shall go out and bomb every building in Britain marked with three stars in the Baedeker Guide. Astonishingly, the Luftwaffe was going to pick its British targets from a heritage guidebook. Of course, Exeter was a sitting target, just a quiet cathedral city, and the Hun was able to do his worst. By the time he'd finished, the place was well ablaze. Exeter's always been known for the beauty of its squares and crescents and circuses. Many of them today were just groups of bare, blackened masonry. With aerial bombardment, you're seeing the deliberate selection of historic cities as targets. The Baydecker raids, Exeter, York, Norwich, Canterbury and Bath. So that picking on heritage as a deliberate target shows the potency of heritage as a national identifier and people's determination to slight it as an act of vengeance, an act of blatant aggression. The king and queen have come to see how Bath now takes its place in Hitler's plan of war. The Germans turn the pages of a traveler's reference book and pick out our beauty spots and historic landmarks for destruction. Bath is famous for both. While they may concentrate their bombers on targets suggested by Mr. Baedeker, the RAF will continue to open up the second front in the skies over Germany. The emotional impact of the Baedeker raids was to have a profound and long-term effect. The bombing of Britain in the Second World War did make people conscious of 
how precious buildings could be. Um, what I mean, before the war, when buildings were destroyed, it was progress. But when they were bombed, of course, it was a product of, of Nazi barbarism. Often buildings after a bombing raid will be vulnerable if their, if their neighboring buildings had fallen down, for instance. How could you make sure that that building remained standing? How could you carry out emergency repairs? So the Ministry of Works has a really important part to play in upholding, literally, the special interest of those buildings. 300 architects were appointed by the government to go around the country very quickly and to look at the bomb cities and to work out which buildings ought to be kept and repaired and which buildings were not so important and could be demolished. It was a massive task covering bombed buildings and intact buildings in the firing line. In effect, an inventory of the nation's greatest architectural assets. In peacetime, it would have been resisted because these were privately owned buildings. In wartime, it happened and it would change the future of heritage protection. These salvage surveys um, became the foundation of what we now know as listing because the lists that were compiled by the architects right in the middle of the war as the bombs were falling became the basis of uh, the listing system that we have today. Listing wasn't going to save your building from being attacked from the air by German bombs. What listing could do, however, was make sure that proper care was taken of it after the bombing raid, that every effort was taken to make sure it remained standing, and thoughtless clearance of a site didn't take place. At last, the Office of Works had a system of safeguarding buildings, inhabited and with roofs on, not just ruins, that did not depend on acquiring them. Before long, the listing process would become enshrined in the Town and Country Planning Acts. To list or not to list would define the post-war heritage world. But the government wasn't the only body making lists. Before the war, a youthful James Lees Milne had been working for the National Trust. Now, newly demobbed due to ill health and back at the Trust, he set out on a fresh mission to convince the owners of the finest country houses to hand them over to the Trust. Maybe in wartime, they would be more open to persuasion. Many of the owners had abandoned their big houses as they were requisitioned by the government for the war effort. Some of Britain's finest houses were now schools for evacuated children, hospitals for injured servicemen, and worst of all, training camps for the services. Many were damaged. Several had caught fire. Most needed urgent repair. The waspish Lees Milne in his diary paints an extraordinary picture of a titled class losing its marbles. Suicidal earls, ladies of the manor living in tree houses, and baronets down to their last butler. He passed judgment on both houses and owners as he travelled, and was not always complimentary. The house is a hideous, pretentious, genteel, over-restored fake, just like its inhabitants. A horrible property. I hope it gets bombed. But to their faces, he was as nice as pie. And the lords and ladies down on their luck seemed to like him. Uh, Lee's Mill went to Eton. He knew many of these families. He spoke to them in their language. Um, being quite ruthless about this, he, he could do it. Uh, and he, he pulled off, effectively, a giant confidence trick on the aristocracy of Britain. Uh, he took away their wealth. Uh, but he said to them, people like me will look after you. You can stay in the house, you can continue to um, pretend it's yours, um, you can continue to enjoy it. Um, you will have the same sense, and your children, most important, will have the same sense, um, that it's still your house. Lee's Mill needed a prize. And at the very top of his shopping list was one of the greatest houses in the country, Knoll in Kent. If he could get Knoll for the trust, if he could convince its owner, the fourth Baron Sackville, formerly known as Major General Sir Charles Sackville West, he would bag for the trust 
a house of unsurpassed architectural splendors with furniture and paintings to match. Most importantly, he knew other owners of great houses would sign their houses over to the trust if someone like Lord Sackville led the way. Built by an Archbishop of Canterbury and dating back to the 15th century, Knoll is so grand, no one's ever been quite sure how many rooms there are. These days, it's home to Robert, seventh Baron Sackville. This room here, um, it's, it's a terrific portrait there by um, Sir Joshua Reynolds of an Italian dancer who was the mistress of John Sackville, third Duke of Dorset. We have her there, we've got the uh, third Duke there, we've got the wife uh, of the third Duke with whom he eventually settled down over the um, fireplace. So they're all meeting in some ghastly family reunion. Sackville ancestors include a Lord Treasurer to Elizabeth I, an ambassador to the court of Louis XIV, and a flamenco dancer nicknamed Pepita. The family survived the Civil War, endless disputes over inheritance, bouts of transgenerational depression, and even riots against them by the angry people of nearby Sevenoaks. But by the 1940s, for the then-incumbent Charles IV Baron Sackville, it looked as though the game was up. In the dark days of war, Knoll had reached its lowest ebb. Pretty much ever since uh, a Sackville family member lived here in the early 17th century, the house has been simply too big uh, for the means of the Sackville family. So they have struggled, or tended to struggle, over centuries with debt. Certainly my great-uncle Charlie often thought that he, or at least his son, would be the last Sackvilles to live at Knoll. It was seen to be a massive burden rather than a pleasure, and he, I think, realised that something had to be done. And um, Charlie and um, James Lewis Milne started to talk about what might happen to Knoll. I mean, James Lees Milne describes some of these conversations and what he says about uh, Charlie is that uh, Charlie was very charming but entered into these discussions with a great, if not suspicion, with uh, a certain wariness. There were no precedents for what happened to um, uh, houses such as this when taken over by the National Trust and more specifically what happened to their um, uh, owners, but James Lees Milne wanted a deal. You know, he wanted to know. Negotiations took the best part of two years and were frequently exasperating. But in October 1943, the London Times announced that a deal had been struck. The terms were generous to the Sackville family. But Lee's Milne had his prize. In 1946, the Sackville family handed over the house. So began the first modern marriage of a titled family and the National Trust. From a um, family perspective, um, we, I guess, are very grateful to um, James Lees Milne for a acquiring Mill and acquiring it on terms that are relatively beneficial to the family. No, it was a very good deal <laughs> um, for the Sackville family. Um, uh, uh, but no, I mean, each of the deals were, 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 were fit for purpose at the time. And there was a serious risk of Noel, um, in effect, disappearing from the public realm. Um, and uh, the negotiators at the time did the best deal they could. And that happened in almost all the cases. Uh, the outcome is, is, uh, is quite remarkable. Um, Noel's open to the public. Noel's safe. Um, the estate is safe, the objects in the house are safe, um, no is a success story. If you'd asked would we do it to such a deal now, no, we wouldn't. Um, the circumstances are very different now. Today, the Trust is carrying out a £17 million restoration to make Noel weatherproof. Replace rotten timbers and window frames and repair stonework. It's a massive operation over five years. <laughs> 
After the acquisition of Knoll by the Trust, many house owners followed Lord Sackville into the Trust stable. No other deal would be quite as generous again. But it had convinced the British aristocracy that the Trust was the only way forward. But it wasn't quite the end of the story. In 1946, the Office of Work, still determined to get into the country house game, went after the finest Jacobean house in the country, Audley End in Essex. It would be a final skirmish. They scrapped about it. James Lee's Milne was incredibly rude about the Office of Works, calling them tasteless. Um, and I suspect, probably behind closed doors, the Office of Works was very rude about the National Trust, thinking they were a, a, a load of aesthetes who didn't know anything about buildings. Uh, the National Trust was very, very keen to have the house. The Office of Works was very, very keen to have the house. It would have been their first country house, and they very much saw that as potentially the founding house of a, of a big collection of what they thought were probably going to be the top dozen houses. That's what they would like to have. They had the top dozen castles, they had the top dozen abbeys, they had the top dozen prehistoric monuments, so quite naturally they wanted the top dozen houses. In the end, the Office of Works got its prize in the form of Audley End, but it was a short-lived victory. As post-war austerity loomed, the Treasury stamped firmly on the Office of Works ambitions. As a matter of fact, our report's on its way to you today. A government report decided the National Trust was the place for houses, and the rest, as they say, is history. Back at Knoll, it's business as usual for the National Trust, and history has moved on from an obsession with a gilded past of dukes and earls. We've got a group of people who are slightly lower down, and we've got a group of people who are a bit higher up. Some of you are clearly rich people. Some of you are very clearly not rich people. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look... The interwar years had seen the men from the Ministry open hundreds of the nation's ruins to the public. The National Trust had evolved to take on the mantle of the country house. And amidst the ruins of the Second World War, the listing system was born. Now, the nation's framework to safeguard its most precious old buildings was in place. But how would it cope with the modern world? In next week's programme, fighting for the most famous monument to the railway age. Betjeman and Pevsner go head to head, sexing up the stately home for mass consumption. And just how modern can heritage get? For more information about English Heritage's complimentary exhibition to the series, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash battle for Britain's past.